you know what the mummy has? The mummy has this sort of, by design or by mistake, or I don't know what, it has this sort of goofy likability. There's something yeah. likable. It's like somebody we just like. Hello everyone, I hope you're all having a wonderful day today. My name is Talal and you're listening to the Popcorn and Soda Podcast, the show where we discuss all things movies, pop culture, and so much more. I want to thank each and every one of you for making me a small part of your day. On today's show, we're joined by a very special guest. He's one of the finest creative artists in the industry today. You've seen him in projects such as The Master, Van Helsing, and as Benny in the pop culture classic, The Mummy, a character that stole the show in every scene he was in. On the show today, the very talented Mr. Kevin J. O'Connor. How are you, Kevin? Good, thank you, how are you? I'm doing well, and thank you so much for coming to hang out on the show today, Kevin. How have you been over these last 18 months, Kevin? We're living in such a crazy world, especially in the creative arts. What did the last two years look like for you? Yeah, it, it's been, it's been, um... You know, I take it very seriously, and uh, like a lot of other, like a lot of people, not everybody, but like a lot of people, and um, I, you know, it's been um, been very strange. It's uh, strange. I haven't done much, you know, but I'll start all that. Um, I just want to be uh, careful and do the right thing. Yeah, absolutely. And it's so true, especially these last 18 months, they've been very difficult for a lot of people for so many different reasons. And in the space of the entertainment medium that we're both in and we're both talking about, it's it's almost come to a standstill in many ways where productions haven't been shut down, strict testing. So, you know what, here's hoping that potentially 2022, again, with everything popping up again, may potentially be a better year for this industry. Yeah. Sure. I hope so. A friend of mine said, uh, you know, I'm kind of a germaphobe anyway. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, uh, I'm using the pandemic as, a, a, as an excuse to finally wear rubber gloves. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, I guess there's some positives for some people. Yes, out of this, yes. Right? There we go. I was somewhat pre pre uh, pre prepared for this in a weird way. But yeah. Well, hey, well, I, here's hoping that hopefully the next few years uh, become a bit more normal because the last few years haven't been so much but no. we'll just see uh that's a lot of it depends on us too right us making sure we're doing our yeah. part in this entire uh, process right and just for things to adjust and to settle and we'll get Absolutely. used to you know wearing masks in the grocery store things like that you know they're, yeah they're already second nature for most of us but it'll, it'll be second nature for hopefully everybody Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Kevin, I'm so fascinated by your story. You have such a great career in the medium where, whether it's TV shows or movies, you've kind of done it all. So where does this all begin for you? What were some of your early influences? And ultimately, what made you want to be in the creative arts? Um, well, I went to, I went to uh, a drama school in the 80s and uh, for four years called the Goodman School of Drama and in Chicago. And um, I had a couple of great teachers and a very supportive mother. No, nobody in my family was ever in the business in any way. Many teachers and uh, policemen and things like that, but teachers mostly in my family. And my brother's a teacher and um, my mother was a teacher. And uh, so I went to a drama school and for four years and I was lucky enough to have some a uh, couple of very good teachers and uh, I got into it that way. But uh, initially how I got into it, since I was a little kid, I watched old movies, which I still do. I watch more old movies than I do new movies. And I mean from silent movies through like the 70s. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, I always have, I always read books about movies. So I didn't really come from a theater 
background, even though I went to drama school for theater, that's all changed. Now it's funny that same school, which has a different name is uh, teaching a lot of um, auditions for film or things like that, or TV acting and, and TV acting. I don't know what's the difference, but, um, but uh, that's how I started really is old movies, watching old movies and, and, and hooking on to old uh, actors that I loved. Mm -hmm. Was there a point in your trajectory where you were like, you know what, this is something I want to do as a full-time career? Do you re recall what that moment was or was it a gradual thing where you just found that this is something that you truly adore doing, you love doing and you have a passion for it? Was it just like a seamless transition? Well, I wasn't a great student in high school. So when I went to drama school, it took me a while, but something sort of clicked and I, I, I got some fairly good response from some of the teachers. And um, I, I swear it was the first time I felt successful at anything. So when that, when that happens to a young person in their late teens or however, 18, 19, you latch on to it or I do because it was like, oh, oh, I'm finally being recognized that I'm um, not terrible at something. And, uh, and I, I, I'd had, I, you know, often I had the ability to make people laugh even when I was younger. And, uh, but like I said, the combination with um, being really obsessive about old actors and old films is really, what is always it still is in my head when I'm on a set I I, I I mostly think about older actors and mm. it meaning influenced by them right well who are some of your uh, favorite actors or some of the favorite movies that really inspired you growing up um I love many different actors I love Charles Lawton um most of all and it's funny when I worked with Daniel Day-Lewis and there will be blood we somehow found out through another person that um, he's a giant fan of Charles Lawton also. So we, we, that's, I think that's how we connected he and I, it's Charles Lawton mm -hmm. and the English actor who was in uh, night uh, directed night of the hunter, the only film he directed and was, uh, and was led to believe by critics that it wasn't a very good movie. And then 20 some years later, it turned into one of the greatest movies ever made by everybody. And, uh, but his performances in Mutiny on the Bounty and Hunchback of Notre Dame and uh, Witness for the Prosecution. Also, um, um, James Cagney was a huge influence on me and uh, uh, Peter Sellers and Boris Karloff and um, Sidney Poitier mm -hmm. in In the Heat of the Night and especially Lilies of the Field. And, um, and uh, yeah, and then later people like Robert Duvall and, uh, so many other people but yeah yeah you know it's uh, i find it really interesting how you brought up that in your family there really weren't any people that went in this trajectory of line of work and the entertainment and the creative arts so i'm curious as someone who's originally breaking into the industry was your trajectory a linear one in terms of booking one role followed by another followed by another or in many ways was it a roller coaster where you have the highs of the highs the lows of the lows a little loop in the middle what did you personally find your trajectory at the start of your career you're you're it's exactly what you said sort of a roller coaster ride yeah but when i finished the four years at drama school i had an audition for a commercial and uh a beer commercial or something. And um, we had done a sort of a, what, what would you call it? Uh, there was a day where all of us who were graduating okay. uh, went on stage okay. with a monologue in front of sure. agents. We didn't know who was out there, really. And there was a woman from William Morris out there and she, she called me and said, uh, after she saw me and she said, why don't you put that monologue you did, which I wrote the monologue. Why don't you put it on tape? And I went to some guy and he taped it and I sent it to her. Well, she sent it to Francis Ford Coppola's um, casting director. And that's how wow. I, and they flew me out there. I'd never flown before. Um, uh, 
and uh, I, I went out to Los Angeles and I met with Francis Coppola, who had a big, I think it was a Japanese Apocalypse Now poster behind his head when I met him. I was already like a huge fan of Coppola, obviously from The Godfather and The Conversation and even things like Finian's Rainbow and One from the Heart and Rumblefish. So uh, I was truly, I think I was just, not, I was in shock the whole time. I don't even know how I got, but he somehow liked the monologue that I wrote. And um, he had me do it several times. And then I read a scene from this movie, Peggy Sue, and I didn't know much about it. And a few weeks later, I got the role. Somehow I got the role. I couldn't believe it. So I was really out of the gate. I was really lucky. Then things started to go way up and down and everything. But at first it was a, um, yeah, it was a, a real big bit of luck. So yeah, so I started off pretty, pretty great working with Coppola. I, nice. I did one movie before I had maybe one or two lines in this movie. The first person to ever hire me was that um, comedian um, who was Senator of Minnesota, uh, uh, Al Franken. He hired me, he's a great guy. And um, he hired me for a small role, but then I got Peggy Sue right after that. And, um, so yeah, it was really, and then like you, as you put it, sort of roller coaster began to happen. Yeah, that's you know. it's interesting how the industry works, right? Especially when you're a brand new actor and right off the gate in your story, you had that high. And naturally, as human beings, we think that the ride stick is continue and continue. It doesn't get higher right. and higher. But it's really interesting with a lot of the creatives that I've spoken to, generally speaking, the trajectory of a lot of young artists really is in this industry. So let's take that and apply it to one of my all time favorite roles and a, a role of yours that I truly believe is one of the best in the entire movie. And that's Benny in The Mummy, which starred sure. Brendan Fraser. This movie is just mm -hmm. a masterclass in action adventure blockbusters, Kevin. Before there was a Pirates of the Caribbean, there was The Mummy. This movie's like, it's lighting in a right. bottle. It really is. A couple of years before it. Pirates, yeah. Yeah. You can rewatch it over and over again and enjoy it equally the same same way every time. Like, of course, we at its core have the three protagonists in Brendan Fraser, John Hanna, and Rachel Weisz. But you truly are the standout of the movie, Kevin. On the surface, oh, Benny... You. No, oh, of course. It's just it's just a fact. And on the surface, Benny is this comedic character that's just kind of thrown in there. But you take the role of Benny and you add so many different layers to this character. So let's deep dive into The Mummy. From the start, sure. how did you originally get involved with this film? I had worked with Stephen on a film called Deep Rising, which has got sort of a cult following now. I don't know if you ever saw Deep Rising, but if you like The Mummy, yeah. you might like this. You might, you should watch it. It's really crazy. Movie. Okay, yeah. And you can kind of see, since you know the mummy uh, so well, you can sort of see how the mummy came from Deep Rising a bit. There's a lot of parallels in there, it sounds like. You'll see when you watch it. It's interesting. It's uh, All um, right. But um, so I did that film with Steve. And about two years later, he told me he was writing a movie and he might use me and... I didn't know what was going to happen with that. And so he, um, so I never auditioned for it because Steve knew me from Deep Rising, which I had auditioned many times for Deep Rising. And so, but Steve knew me and I think he had originally in the script, from what I remember, it was a chubby sort of um, Frenchman. And we, I said to Steve, you know, maybe we can change. He said, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll change it. I said, maybe, obviously, I'm not short and round. And um, so we sort of changed it together, the role, and he gave me a lot of, uh, a lot of leeway. And um, Steve was always, always so great about, uh, you know, he said that if you write a line or something, just tell me what it is. And he was, uh, uh, he's very uh, democratic that way. You know, he's really, um, uh, everybody. A collaborator, I think he yeah, wants, he seems like. He, he's everybody's in on it. Mm -hmm, exactly, yeah. wants everyone in on it. And um, 
and he put a lot of trust in me and uh, which was nice and so we sort of came up with the character together and uh, we we made him a little more um a little more of an oddball i think yeah. that was originally written Definitely. And it's a, it's a very three-dimensional character, especially with what you do with the accent of Benny, especially the body language of Benny. So when you were originally coming up with the idea of this character with Steven, at what point did you guys get to a point where it was like, we nailed it? Was this, did it ever come at that point before production or was it an ongoing process throughout the, the shoot where you guys are kind of tinkering with the character? Well, what started was interesting. We, 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 we got to look at the the costume designs on paper. Mm -hmm. And when I saw mine, it was completely something I didn't, I, I, it, it was not what I was, what was going on in my mind. That I, were, I had the script yeah. for a couple months and it was a kind of a rougher looking character with uh, Andaleros on his chest, you know, with the bullets and the, almost like one of those cork those Australian hats that go up on one side, you know, like sure, Australian yeah. court hats, whatever. Mm. Tougher guy with boots, these big boots. And and um, I said, oh no, Benny's a thief. You know, he's a, he's a, he's a, um, he's not yeah, a, he's always he's like a snake. A he, yeah, he's not that exactly. like big bouldering guy. He's like, he, he shaped like shapes into different, depending on the situation, he kind of morphs into that, yeah. Exactly. You put it better than me. Exactly. And, and I lost weight for the role. You know, I lost about 20 pounds for the role uh -huh. because I wanted to always look hungry, almost like this. I had this image of a sort of a, some sort of bird, a vulture in the desert, you know, a skinny vulture. Um, one that misses out on the carcasses, you know, <laughs> one that gets there just a little too late. Um, and, uh, so so that kept building and luckily the, the costume designer was this great really talented guy and i think at first he was a little put off by it but then i think he understood what i was saying with the character but he did say one funny thing he said i wanted sandals i wanted him to wear sandals which is what i wore and he said um i had he had me in boots and i said no no i was being an actor I think he's in sandals and blah, blah, blah. And he said, um, do you know anything about the, 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 the desert sand when we get to Morocco? <laughs> and I said, oh, no. What? And when I saw things moving in there, I realized why he wanted me to wear boots. So, but I think it just added to the nervousness of my care and the cowardice of my character. <laughs> well, I told this story to, I told this story to Entertainment Weekly. This, I think it's the scene at the beginning in the French Foreign Legion where yep. I yep. run away from him and close that door. <laughs> well, that, to that tomb that I went into, I had to wait back there for a few minutes till they said cut. And there was someone back there, but it was pitch dark. Wow. And when I was there and Brendan Fraser was knocking on the door, before he could even knock, I looked down and I saw something move and I jumped, I pushed the tomb door out and Brendan was about to knock on the door and I came walking out and I said, cut, cut. And Steve Summers said, what are you cutting for? I said, something moved, something moved. And one of the men, the Moroccan men who was working on the show picked up a, a black cord or a rope. <laughs> this is what I was so frightened of. So uh, I think I, at that point realized I was Benny. <laughs> well being part of a movie with such massive set pieces and having to work through the elements of the shoot as we're talking about right now the moroccan heat the, the forces of nature in terms of just potential snakes or beetles or whatever you can find in the sand can you talk about some of the difficulties that go into a production specifically with this film that you encountered yeah i mean it was a really big movie not as big though as Van Helsing. That was massive, but the mummy was very big. And um, there's so much going on that you don't want to get lost in the shuffle, you know? And um, right. you, but there are times where you have to go for it. I'll give you a perfect example. I think this will be it. Tell all this will be it in a nutshell for you. 
Mm -hmm. Remember the scene where I, I think Rachel and I get thrown out of the sand sort of tornado thing that the mummy, yeah, yeah. We, we fall on. And we, that's when we see Brendan flying in the air with the, the airplane. Yep. I and seen. he, he um, makes that big wave with the mouth open to get the uh, uh, purpose, uh, to trying to, to crash Brendan's plane, yeah, which he yeah. does. So after that scene, if you remember this, you may not, I go up to the mummy and I say, I love that big sand wall thing you did. It was beautiful. It's really, and I compliment him. The reason I did that was because so much is going on that I wanted to know what it looked like that we were looking at. You have to ask these questions because it's not there. We're out in the middle of Morocco in the desert. So they had one of the, they called one of the special effects men and he, he described it to me. And what he said over the phone, this is a half hour before I shot the thing. What he described to me over the phone was it's like a big wall of sand that they're mm -hmm. getting hit with. So that was in my head. So we did one take where I went up to the mummy and I, to Arno Vaslu, Imhotep, and I told him that that was beautiful. The big wall, to, you know, trying to once again kiss his rear end at every chance I could. But it was only because I was, and I never thought that would be in the movie. Oh, to, not even for a thought. We all laughed afterwards and it was in the movie. Me describing the special effect. That's me describing what I just heard from the special effects. So well, what that says, what, what, what that, what that's about really is those movies can be so overwhelming when you're in them. And I haven't done as many as other actors, but you, you have to ask the question, what you're looking at, where you're looking. Mm -hmm. And you have to always be in, in deep rising. There's sort of a octopus squid creature that is killing off everybody. And that was truly insane. So you're asking, what does this thing look like? What is it? Wh where is it at? Because you're not seeing it right. at the moment. And um, even now, they have much more advanced. I mean, I think I saw in one of the Spider-Man movies where the actors are looking at the uh, the concept film where they can yeah. see things going. So that's amazing. But then we didn't. I didn't have that. Yeah, that's it's so true, especially in terms of like the evolution of special effects and especially more so in the last 20 years with just sure. the advancements of so many of these things where now you can actually see like the previs or you can even see they have like moving sets now with the videos where you can kind of see what you're looking at. It's it's really fascinating. Just I wonder in the yeah. next 20 years how much further this is going to go. Now, sure. yeah, one thing you even mentioned just right off the bat here is the conversation we're having about benny and how he's just adapting to whatever situation he's in and uh, made him relate to uh, a vulture in many ways and like a hungry vulture someone who just wants more and more and more and i love that because one of the best parts about this movie is the relationship that benny has with brendan frazier's richard o'connell and then arnold voslu's emotep it really shows how much of a survivor benny is and how he will do anything to just save his rear end pretty much so let's Absolutely. start with brendan yeah let's start with brendan what are your memories of working opposite of him great we really got along and um we had done a day or two on a film called gods and monsters several years before but briefly and i didn't really get to know him then and um so but we knew each other and uh we uh Brendan is very good at coming up with things. So he came up with a lot of things. He's also an actor that does many different takes each time, you know, and uh, me, not so much. I s finally kind of find what I do and I sort of stick to it, mm -hmm. even though some of it may be improvised, but not really improvised. I work on it or I change the line or I ask Steve and um, I, I, he's a little looser than I am probably, but, um, but still the same thought of uh, make, sort of changing it, making something work a little bit better and, uh, or trying to. And, but he was a very 
a very nice guy, very um, perfect for that role. Mm -hmm. And, um, and yeah, I really, really liked working with him. Yeah. And then you have the contrast with Arnold, especially now Benny's in a situation where he's just trying to stay alive and just adapt and in his own way, maybe try to get some off Emotep as well and try to maybe steal some of the gold in which we've seen, which we'll dive sure. into in a minute. So what are your memories of working with Arnold in uh, these scenes? I, I, I really liked Arnold. Um, I, I think I maybe kept a, a distance from Arnold because of those roles. Um, I think that was in my head that I sort of wanted that subservient uh, relationship with Arnold. And he has that about him anyway. He has sort of a, uh, he's a real presence, you know, he's, he's uh, really important in that film. I mean, he, he really centers that film uh, and, he doesn't play it for laughs or anything. He he plays it as a uh, as a real villain, you know, and uh, a serious threat. And um, he was very smart to play it that way. So I was able to be that uh, um, somewhat, uh, you know, more um, quirky sort of character yeah. playing off of him you know i've been a supporting actor character actor for so many years the people that i support someone like arnold or brendan or daniel day lewis and there would be blood or whoever it is i try to get what they're doing too so i know how to support them in the right way mm -hmm. i want everything to sort of flow together as opposed to me doing something completely uh, out of the blue that doesn't gel with the the lead with the lead the lead the lead actor actress are really important in a film because they are the film in a way they they represent the film right. so um, it's important to uh, to get an idea of, to try to figure out maybe what their take on this is, you know? So, and then play against that or play with it or play, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like the yin to the yang to it in many ways. It does, it really does. Uh, and that and you show that in this movie, it really do. And I want to jump into a few scenes of mine that I just absolutely love. And I think those are two of the best scenes in the movie. And that's largely just because of your amazing portrayal of Benny, your amazing acting and just the body language that you just display as his character. So the first one I want to talk to you about is that scene where he originally comes across Amotep, who's in his mummy form. And this is Benny in its full out survival mode where he just starts saying all those different languages. He's got the necklaces. That's such a great, this comedic scene and just describes Benny to a T. Uh, what was going through your mind when you're shooting that scene? Because that's just classic. It took it took almost like a half a work day of just me. First they brought in Arnold and then they got rid of Arnold for whatever special effect. Um, uh, but they needed from Arnold at first and then they put it a certain way. And that's a little bit beyond my understanding. But the reasons why they need him at some point. Um, but I I was able to, it was only a little bit in the script about him taking out these things and speaking different languages. So Steve let me have it. I took it home with me and worked on that for about three weeks. Wow. What you see on the film and Steve seemed to really like it. So I came in and I had gotten tapes of, I think it's a Chinese voice that I was trying to interpret with, or, or trying to imitate. So I had different people. I asked for these different things and they sent me different, um, different people praying in different languages. And the Chinese person happened to be, it sounded like a young girl. So my voice in that movie is imitating her. That's why I go high on that thing. But that's how I memorized it. Memorized it in a somewhat sloppy way, and I wanted it to be funny too. So, um, so uh, it's 
it's it's it's I was able to work on that for a couple of weeks. So when I brought it in, I was I think even more ready to do that than I thought I was. So and Steve nice. seemed to be happy with it. So and I was able also, if you know something well enough, then you're able me, I should speak for myself, then I'm able to put little details in there. And there's little there's little bits of breathing. There's even a, a few throwaway things like, oh, that didn't work. <laughs> you know, I'm mumbling to myself about how it's going <laughs> while I'm doing it. And um, that's always funny to me if there's a character running, 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 running from some some dog or some monster. And he actually says out loud, boy, I'm tired from running this much, you know, and then continues to run. You know, to me, there's something funny about commenting. <laughs> while you're doing it's sort of like the, the sand wall thing in a way. So I was right. able to throw those little details in that if you listen to it, you can hear a little um, asides I put in there. Uh, some even Easter little, eggs there for everyone. Yeah, all right. that's, that's great. I say, all right, all right, like, wait a second. I think I have another one that might work. <laughs> so I was able to work on that long enough, uh, which is to Steve's credit. Mm -hmm. No. The second scene I want to talk to you about, again, it's a uh, spoiler alert for anyone who hasn't seen the movie. Uh, I'll give you three, two, one. All right. So in the scene where we unfortunately meet Benny's demise, it's uh, that entire little half hour of the third act of the movie. It's very fascinating because it kind of just goes back to Benny's human nature of how he just wants more and more and more. The guy gets the gold that he wants. He gets out, but... Hey, you know what? What's a little bit more? What harm can a little bit more do? And it's mm -hmm. it's a contrast to the beginning of the movie where Brendan Fraser's character gets Benny locks him out of that uh that little tomb in the start, and now in the very end, Brendan Fraser's character tries to save Benny, but of course it's a little too little too late. You, you know, it's recall... funny. I never looked at it that way. That's a really good observation. I never looked at it that way. It's almost the same thing. The closing it... of this thing. Very good. Yeah. Hey, no, I trust me. I, when I when I when I told when I tell you this is one of my all time favorite movies and you're one of my all time favorite characters, believe me, I got this locked down. <laughs> what do you recall the most about that scene where we meet Benny's demise, and of course where we see Benny just locked up in this tomb where we know eventually what's going to happen to him? Um, two things. Once again, I had to contact special effects and ask them. Well, the first thing was when that ceiling is closing in on me and I'm with the torch. Well, someone in the art department didn't quite take into account that I had a, a live flame in my hand and they just spray painted to fix up something maybe that wasn't to their liking. Oh, well, when, when the flame of the torch hit the wall, it went down and burnt all the hair off my hands and part of my eyebrow. Wow. And, um, and, uh, so that was, uh, I was all right. You know, I just was in shock. It happened so fast. And uh, and then of course I saw Brendan Fraser turn around and start to laugh. First he asked me, are you all right? And I said, I'm fine. And then he turned around and laughed. At least it was in that order. Um, <sighs> it was very funny. But the second thing was, I wanted to know how many of the, uh, of the uh the bugs, beetles the yeah, beetles little, like go, yeah, scare, yeah. scare beetles were there because for some reason in the script i didn't get the idea that there were that many and um but that, but that was very fun to play with me mm -hmm. noticing the one the one that flicks his wings and i, I yeah. kind of cock my head a little bit <laughs> and then which was really great that the torch goes out you don't see me get it but you just hear it which was great uh, much more frightening and much more fun and old fashioned. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one thing that's changed since the mummy originally came out is the way consumers today watch movies, watch TV shows and largely with streaming. It's kind of really changed the game where we have everything at the palm of our hands with the remote control. If you've got Netflix, Amazon, whatever, you can watch anything, anytime. Now, mm -hmm. people continue to discover and rediscover the mummy for the first time. How often do you get people coming up to you or reaching out through social media that, hey, I just watched this movie last week and it's just amazing? <laughs> yeah, I'll have people that um, 
you know, their kids just saw it or uh, um, because it's on so much. And um, yeah. and uh, I, I never, to be honest, I never thought we'd be talking about the mummy 20 years later. Um, I mean, I like I like the movie and it's a fun movie and it's this, but it really, I've worked with, you know, I did a project with some younger actors in it and uh, younger than me, you know, they were in their twenties. And uh, one of them just has seen the mummy 25 times. I mean, he loves this movie and it's so funny. Um, it's just one of those things that must be hit, like you said, lightning in a bottle because you've got to remember what was opening up either the weekend before or the weekend after was the Phantom Menace. So there was not a lot of hope for the mummy. They didn't think the mummy would do anything really until it started to pick up. And that movie just kept staying in the movie theater, staying there. Phantom Menace did what it had to do, but yeah. it didn't affect the mummy. Yeah. And I guess that a lot of that discredit goes to you and the entire team because there's something about the movie where, you, and it's, you know what, you can say maybe it's smart marketing or maybe it's good counter marketing because not everyone wants to watch Phantom Menace, which I'm pretty sure everyone at that point did want to watch it. But now here's an alternative. If mom and dad don't want to watch Phantom Menace, they can go watch The Mummy. They can leave the kids off at uh, well, Phantom Menace. You know, what, you know what The Mummy has? The Mummy has this sort of, by design or by mistake, or I don't know what, it has this sort of goofy likability. There's something yeah. likable. It's like somebody we just like is that movie. And I think it's Steve Summers, the number one person, um, directed and wrote it. And he, that's his sensibility. That's the way he is. He's sort of a fun, likable, smart guy. But very likable, very warm, very not a very Hollywood kind of guy. Yeah. And Brendan Fraser and uh, John Hanna. And they they have that sort of same sort of real person, likable sort of quality to them all. And I think that that um, you don't see that in every you don't see that in those big adventure films. I don't mm -hmm. think you don't see that quality a lot. That sort of just likable. Um, so there's sort yeah. of a sweetness to it, even though it's a adventure horror movie, there's sort of a sweetness to the whole thing. And I always say a goofy likability. Yeah. It, it's almost become this like cult like film where it's, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, all the reasons like, it's very likable. The cast is very likable. People can kind of relate to these characters. And it's just a good, fun time for the entire movie. This is one of those movies that's always on at my house whenever anything's like, it's one of those things sure. that you can just rewatch over and over again. And everyone kind of plays their part in creating that. Now, whether that's, as you mentioned, by design or just by the forces that be that people mm -hmm. grew attached to this movie. Now, I know the... Tom Cruise mommy movie that came out wasn't a direct reboot of this, but I'm I'm wondering, did you have a chance to watch that movie, or is that something you I never I never saw it. Not that I wouldn't see it, but I just never saw it. Yeah, it's um, it's it's very different, of course, because they're trying to do their own. I think they're trying to launch a full new dark universe with all the universal oh, right, monsters. Right. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a very different movie, but it's it's funny when that movie came out. I, the mummy, the original one started trending again because people for better or worse just wanted to compare the two and overwhelmingly everyone just loves the original one so much to a point where almost naming the movie the mummy kind of backfired because you have this universal university love movie and now you're making a new movie called the mummy. It's just, it didn't sound yeah. like it, it was, it could have been some changes. I think that may have potentially marketed that better. Yeah, maybe. But, um, you know, like I said, it's also when things hit, you know, people of even a little older than you, but your age, and when they saw it when they were younger, the mummy, it's like the movie, who would ever think the movie, um, I was in college, so I, ha I never saw it when it, the Goonies, Goonies. Goonies, yeah. That movie has such a, what people love that movie from that, you don't know, 
I mean, it's fine. It's fine. It's an adventure film, but it, I was a little too old for it. But people have attached, they're so attached to that movie. And I think the mummies like that too, you know, that a certain group of people that when they, uh, they got older, they didn't want to let a movie like the mummy go because they had such warm feelings towards it. And that's really nice. You know. Yeah, that, that's so true. And especially because, as you kind of mentioned there, a lot of the things you watch as children that kind of stick with us and things that really impact us are the ones that really keep moving our creative palettes forward and the types of movies you like. I watched this movie when sure. I was like five or six, and I still sure. remember the feelings that I had when I first watched it with my entire family. So sure. I, I think it's great. It's like Willy Wonka. Great. Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory was me when I was six years old and I saw that I was mesmerized by that movie mm. and I still have the feeling of what it was when I first saw that movie. I thought I was yeah. watching magic, you know? <laughs> well, you know, yeah, so, Kevin, yeah. I, I agree with you so much on that. There's something that you just can't describe or put into word. It's just that feeling that comes over. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because you bring up Wonka. That's actually one of the movies for me as well. I watched it much later on uh, when I first started watching a, movies in English. It's it's one of those things that sticks with you. It really does. And I think that's the likability factor about The Mummy. So looking back at your overall experience on this movie, what are some of the things you take away and hold with you even till this day? Um, like I said, I, I have people like yourself and Entertainment Weekly that did a story on it a year or two years ago. Um, uh and I have people, you know, that will talk about it. We just saw you and the mummy. We just saw this. And um, it's, uh, it's, that's what I, it's really a nice feeling to uh, have that, you know, in any film, you do, a, you do a bunch of, you do a ton of work, or if you're lucky enough to do a ton of work, or in my case, you do work here and there, and you, uh, once in a while, something really lands, and it's uh, it's really nice. It's it's so unexpected because I think when when movies try too hard to uh, I don't know how to put it, um, you know, like cult movies, and I'm talking about lower budgeted maybe cult movies, right? Where they're kind I've of trying movies. to fall into the traps of what makes a cult movie because there really exactly. isn't a template. Yeah, and it doesn't yeah. work that way. It, it doesn't, doesn't work. No. You know, the, the Evil Dead uh, didn't work that way. It works so well because Bruce Campbell and Sam Raimi, and I've worked with Bruce, were, were working, you know, non-stuff. They're working as hard as they could on such a nothing budget and they just wanted to get through. But you had creative, funny, funny people making it. So then it turned into a cult film. And later... Films, when you see them, as you said, sort of trying almost too hard to make a cult for a lot of times it doesn't work. And I yeah. think even The Mummy, even though it was a much bigger to big, uh, bigger movie than those films, um, I don't think we were thinking that 20 years from now we'll be interviewed about the movie or, you know, or it will be compared so favorably to a remake to, you know, nobody thought that way. Mm -hmm. We're just trying to get through the movie and and uh, do a try to make the best movie we could make in that in that uh, world of action adventure comedy horror whatever and yeah. um, things just sort of dovetailed. It doesn't happen all the time. Yeah, it, most it really of the doesn't. Time it doesn't happen. It, yeah, you, you, well, I, I think even in general, like Kevin, the way it works and you're living proof of it as someone who's in the industry, who's seen so many different movies that have different meanings to different people. A lot of your work, you've done so many different types of roles and so many different types of projects that the way that you and I are talking about The Mummy, there's people that love Van Helsing or There Will Be Blood in the same way in many ways. And, and I think that a lot of it is, you're a little too modest, I think, but I think a lot of it is to do with you, Kevin. You're just how great of an actor you are and just oh, how much effort you put into it. I, I really think that you play a big part in that. Let's shift gears back to you, Kevin. I know we spoke earlier about some of your love of old school cinema, black and white films, mm -hmm. like all sorts of different things like that. Now, is there anything in today's cinema that you've liked 
Oh, of course. I mean, I can't think of anything, you know. Uh, like, are you a fan of know, the Marvel movies or the Star Wars movies now or generally I, speaking? I, I, I've seen things sporadically. I, I, I really liked, um, I have a friend, Peyton Reed, who directed the Ant-Man Ant yeah. film. And I really liked those. I haven't seen every Marvel film, but they're very, very well made. And um, some of the Star Wars films I've seen, not all of them, but they're the Mandalorian I watched with my brother and that was excellent. So those things I loved um, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I thought that was oh. one of the best films I've seen in five years. That was a great film. And, um, uh, you know, people like Anthony Hopkins and older people are still making great Helen Marin, they're still making Judy Dench, they're still making these great films. And so, um, you know, I watch uh, Richard Linkletter and, you know, there's some really great people, really, really yeah. excellent. I was able to work with Steve McQueen on a movie called Widows, uh, which is a good film. And he's a great director. And uh, 12 Years a Slave, I mean, that was monumental. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, so, uh, so yeah, uh, there are things I watch, but I don't watch them as, comp with the older actors, I probably watch their work. I know where everything lands. I know when they did this film and when they did that film. And, they, and I don't think about modern films in the same way. Right. That's all. Right. So I'm sort of a completist when it comes to the older, older school, you know people yeah. and the older directors but even guys like from the 70s like that i love like uh uh you know of course martin scorsese and coppola and and uh robert altman who i was lucky enough to work with when i was younger and um and uh hal ashby and um from the 70s and 60s and people like that you know i mm -hmm. i i love a lot of those films so today what are the types of roles that you want to play and what kind of roles attract you nowadays that's a good question and you know i don't it's an excellent question but i don't really look at it that way mm -hmm. i look at a, what's lucky enough to come my way and when i look at the role is it something that i feel i could really that i'm right for that i can do something interesting with the role so um first of all, can I do the role? And then can I do something interesting with the role? And sometimes I have to just get it on its feet, walk around for a few days and talk to myself and walk a certain way or talk with mm -hmm. a certain rhythm and try to see if it starts to uh, gel. So it's, it's, I don't really look for anything in sp any specific thing. There are things I don't want to do, you know, I, I can't think of them now, but there's things that I maybe I, I don't feel like I, it's it, that are right for me. Sure, sure. Maybe it's more of a type of film than than a role that's not really my my thing, you know. Hmm. Yeah, you know? That, that's, yeah, it makes sense. And it's what I like about your answer, Kevin, is that it's, it's very specific to you. And it's very, I agree with it in many ways in terms of having the role be again looking at it as a point of being lucky enough to get roles because especially us talking about this conversation at the top nowadays it's very difficult especially with the way the world is right now to get productions up and running uh getting finance for all these things so someone coming to you with an offer for a role it's of course that's very humbling and it's great that a lot of actors are getting work nowadays but uh, what i also like is the fact that you uh, you kind of don't say yes to everything you want to see if you can make it your own. And I think something from me watching your filmography is you kind of put a bit of yourself just from me speaking to you in this conversation that I can see so much of you in a lot of your roles just from the uh, things you've spoken about. And I think that's one of the reasons why you're such a great actor is that you take from within and then you work with the filmmakers that you're going to be working with and you collaborate together to make a character. I think that's the best way to make something come to life. Yeah, it takes, what it takes is, and I've noticed this with other actors, oh my God, if you're around Daniel Day-Lewis, he's, it's the focus. 
it's you know his focus is so laser beam intense and uh, other actors too i know it's it's focus and i really think that um um for me i'm a i'm a real worrier i worry about a lot of things that uh, i worry too much and I, sometimes I put that into it too, and sometimes a little too much, and I worry a little too much about it. Where I see some, you know, maybe I'll see an actor that doesn't seem to be that worried and seems to maybe doesn't know his lines as well as me. And I think, boy, is it? And then when I watch the finished product, that person could be so great. I go, oh my God, he's so great. There's just something about film that captures certain people the right way. And he probably knows that person probably knows that that works for him. That looseness yeah. works for him. And um, and I'm jealous of it. It's not like it's not a backhanded compliment. I'm sure there's some um, reasoning for keeping someone keeping themselves in a certain mood. Absolutely. As we wrap up sure. with the great Kevin J. O'Connor, it is now time for a segment I call The Final Act. Kevin. I'm going to ask yes. you a series of rapid fire questions about your likes and your dislikes. I just want the first thing that pops into your mind. Let's go for it. Movies or TV shows? Movies. Theater or watch at home? Watch at home. Favorite movie? Singing in the rain. Favorite TV show? The Dick Van Dyke Show. Favorite trilogy? I'm going to cheat a little. It's not a trilogy. There's about five of the movies. The Planet of the Apes movies. The original. And I like the new ones too. All right. We're all good with the originals. Does pineapple belong on pizza? No. Summer or fall? You don't even, that's a great, this is the best question you ask me out of these little group here. <laughs> you have no idea. If, if someone, if you knew people that know me, they would laugh at this question. Fall. Ask me any season. Fall. <laughs> ask me what my favorite time of my life's have been, my life has been. Fall. I love the fall. Is your birthday in the fall? Yes. No, maybe there's some uh, connection to that there. <laughs> maybe. Favorite, could be, could be. Favorite character in The Mummy? Brendan Fraser. Rick. Describe, yeah. Describe Brendan Fraser in one word. Enthusiastic. And lastly, to put a bow on it, describe Benny in one word. Hungry. <laughs> Bam, you killed it at that, Kevin. You really did. Thank you so much for being a guest on the show today, Kevin. And thank you for your contributions to the creative arts. The Mummy is one of my all-time favorite movies, and you play a massive part in creating the love that I have for that film. I truly wish you all the best, and I look forward to having you back on the show to discuss your next project. Can I ask you one question? Absolutely. What's your favorite movie? Ah. <sighs> It's a tough one. It would, That's uh, so easy, huh? Uh, you're interviewing me now. Uh, you know what? I would, hey. if I had to say it off the top of my head, I'm not just saying this because you're. I'm talking to you. I would truly say the Mummy is one of my favorite movies of all time. It truly is. Okay. It truly is. I and... accept it. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Tom.